afternoon, folks. It is now time for us to talk about chameleons, as we do on Saturday mornings. This is Chameleons and Coffee, and of course, I have come prepared. Prepared. And as soon as we get people on, I am going to prove to you that I actually have coffee in here. So let's see. Let's bring up the chat here. Oh, Joanne, thank you very much. My goodness, you started this off with support. Thank you very much, Joanne. Oh, I really appreciate that. Here we go. Oh, I can show it. Show it. There we go. All right. Jenny's here. She says, okay, have my coffee and my crepple jelly filled donut only eaten during a carnival in Germany. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, look at this. Oh, once again, I'm getting the cuties coming by and uh, hanging out here. I love it. And for those who don't know, that's my uh, wife's other, <laughs> other YouTube. <laughs> oh, hello, Facebook user. Unfortunately, they don't tell me who you are. And so uh, go ahead and put your name in the uh, caption and I can tell who you are. James is here. Thank you very much uh, for joining us, James. Good to see you. And uh, let's see, Howard. Jason. Oh, thank you, Jason, from there. And hey, we've got somebody from uh, South Wales. All right. <laughs> so we are, we, we have all sorts of uh, people here. Where is it? And so I do have my, uh, my coffee. This is my cold brew coffee. This is actually chameleon cold brew coffee. And this is for the people who really need evidence because I have been accused of not having coffee in my cup during chameleons and coffee, and it's gotten to be an ugly conversation. So, hello, Lazarou, Gabriel, and uh, Stephanie. So, Broken Cade, thank you. And uh, I, okay, just love saying hello to everybody. Now, uh, uh, just a little bit of news. I, I've got this very interesting thing. You say it looks like a dog biscuit, um, and it and it is. But this here is a humid grade, human grade dog biscuit. It's peanut butter and uh, and bananas. And so uh, my wife, yeah, gave me a dog biscuit. Now some people may say, "Hey, okay, you know, you're you're being uh, put at the same level of as as a dog." And uh, actually, my daughter said that a little while ago. We were joking joking around because her and I have a a very high level of smack talking uh, just as a general going back and forth. And she said, are you calling me a dog? And, uh, and I said, you wouldn't be that lucky because in this household, uh, the dogs are treated like royalty. And so for, yes, for me to get uh, a dog biscuit, that is actually a compliment to me. And this is human grade. And so what the heck I'll try it. Not that bad. Oh, hey. Oh, hey, Tom's here. My mug. Yes, my mug. Patrick is saying, I uh, hope you are well. I am well. Hello, Rick. Um, and Kayla just got her Dragon Ledges in the mail. Excellent, excellent. Uh, Jason's asking, what is she training you for? That's, she's offering you biscuits to you. Um, you know, the scary thing is, I'm not sure. I just know that. I'll do anything for a biscuit. And so, yeah, maybe I ought to look into exactly what I do. And I shouldn't be doing it uh, without, oh, you know what? I get a biscuit. I don't care. <laughs> oh, Howard says, so Bill, you're saying is that you're always in the dog house. Yes. <laughs> yes. And that is, that is good around here. Um, so, uh, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the chameleon world. I just did a, um, I did a, uh, episode podcast episode. And, uh, just a reminder, most of the time I'm going to be doing a podcast on one Friday. And then the next Friday is going to be a chameleon hour on YouTube. And then they're going to back, go back to the podcast back and forth like that. Every now and then you'll end up getting a podcast and a chameleon hour because uh although that's the uh, every other week is my standard hey if i've got something to say i'll go ahead and do both but uh this is the uh, the week for the podcast 
and I have uh, uh, I evaluated cup drinking. So uh, give chameleons uh, water in a cup as a hydration method. And uh, the, the reason uh, th it's kind of a, a fringe technique in the community. Um, and, and we get a lot of those. You've got a lot of different uh, social media groups and uh, these social media groups kind of uh, become their little island. And you have this culture that develops within the social media group. You can go to a uh, uh, that that's the Reddit group. You can go to the Facebook group and there's so many different Facebook groups and there's different cultures within each Facebook group and they all believe these different things. And so you will end up with, uh, you will end up with a lot of different opinions being thrown at you, especially if you're the type that says, oh, I like chameleon communities and you just jump and you're part of all these different communities then you've got all these contradicting, uh, contradictory things flowing into your brain, and you're saying, "Oh my goodness, well, how do I, how do I sort through all of this?" And uh, I, I guess it, it's not that bad when you get different ideas and different approaches. It just gets confusing when those different ideas and different approaches are included with a uh, an admonition that. Everything else out there is wrong. Uh, the uh, the cup drinking thing is included with this uh, this the saying that misting uh, produces bacteria on leaves, and so that's dangerous for your chameleon. So if you don't do it this way, you're risking your chameleon. See, and and that's a lot of these groups I, that gets a lot of attention. So a lot of these groups when they come up with these these techniques, they attach with it kind of a, a, a fear tactic. And then if you don't do this, it's death, destruction all over. Um, and, and of course, every, every, there's just variations on everything, but I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, that is the reason why beginners are so confused. And uh, you, you get yourself set up on one group, and then you merrily tripes over and decide you're going to be talking to another group for a while. You show them your setup and they're going, oh, my goodness, that's horrible. We got to start all over. And every time you go to another group, you got to start all over. And so uh, there is uh, there's got to be a way that we all evaluate all the different ideas out there and make a decision, a, an intelligent decision that serves us. And it's okay that you visit five different groups, but you need to be able to put those five different opinions into perspective. And they can't all be right. They can't all be the best. Uh, there's got to be some sort of weighing system. And so that's that's what the podcast was about. And that's what we'll talk about today. So let me go ahead and take a look at the, uh, the uh, uh, who's here. Hello, Katrina. And... Uh, Bill, please cover the winter funks if you could, please. Winter funks. I don't know about the winter funks. You mean, uh, uh, explain winter funks. I don't know if that's an autocorrect. Oh, Jonathan Hill's here. <laughs> yeah, it's in the Reddit technique. Um, Muhammad Ali has a question of what is the mating age for a female panther chameleon? Uh, when, the, when they become adult, adult coloration, uh, the actual age will depend upon uh, the husbandry to get them up to there. Uh, okay, we've got a lot of uh, a lot of interesting things. Let, let's go ahead and talk about my what what I talked about in the podcast, or or techniques in the community that you have questions about that there's a lot of contradictory advice on, and you want to sort through which way to look on it. So uh, let's uh, let's focus on that for a little while, and then later on we can go to general chameleon questions. Um, let's see. Oh, hello, Eliza Ann. Um, <laughs> Tom's saying, apparently people don't get the winter funks in California. Uh, are we talking about people? Are chameleons? Uh, yes, you're going to have to explain what a winter funk is. I'm in Southern California. Um, so, oh, chameleon goes through the winter. Okay, okay. Yeah, we, we should talk about winter funks. Uh, Nathan Gray, I like your approach in the podcast, looking at the drinking glass from an unbiased perspective. Like most of the isolated social media groups, where it's my way or the highway. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I obviously uh, there was a whole lot of my opinion included in there, 
but I am hoping that I was effective in doing a an evaluation that allowed you to make your own decisions, uh, even though I also included my opinions. And, and that's that's really what's important here when I talk about critical thinking is that you make your own decisions for your own reasons. Uh, if you decide that what I say is the absolute truth, you're going to trust. Well, maybe not the absolute truth. And say, yeah, if you say, I trust Bill, he's really, uh, he's really looked into this. And so what I know I can trust what he says. Um, and that's okay. And so you do what I say, or you do what the Reddit group says, or what Facebook group say. Until you understand the uh, the pros and cons of everything that you're doing, don't go to another group and fight for that. So if I say I don't support cup drinking, uh, I don't think it's a good technique, I don't think you should do it, take that and you can evaluate that for yourself. But don't go like to the Reddit group and start saying, oh, your technique is horrible and you're going to kill chameleons and all that. Um, don't, you, you don't have to save the world. At this point, just save your own chameleon. Deal with your own chameleon. Decide who you trust. Uh, there, there's so many politics in the chameleon world like there is with any, anytime you get humans together. Uh, you will be much, much happier if you stay out of those politics. Uh, I try to stay out of them. I can't. So I do my best, but uh, yeah, I'm not very effective when you're doing what I do. So let's see. Uh, let's uh, let's take a look at uh, some uh, some uh, comments, and then uh, we'll we'll talk a little bit about uh, drinking glasses, and then we can get into some fun stuff of evaluating some other controversial stuff in the community, and we'll we'll put the evaluation to them. Um, but there's this uh, winter funk. Chameleon goes through a winter funk from about mid-November to mid-February. Just starting to come up. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, one thing that's important to know is that chameleons, they go through a wet season and a dry season, the ones near the equator do. And the dry season is a cooler season. And so they are used to going through a cool season uh, where they just don't do much. And so those are natural behaviors that are often triggered by our, that can be triggered by our cold and often dry uh, um, uh, uh, weather patterns. Now, I don't know exactly what triggers, is it the cold, is it the dry that triggers them to go into a funk uh, we talk about Parsons chameleons going to bromation. And, and this is because, like in Madagascar, where the Parsons come from, uh, during the wet season, it's uh, even, even if it's cool and it can be warm, it's wet. There's water everywhere. There's food everywhere. When it's dry, there's no water. No water available. And so they have to conserve their energy. They have to definitely conserve their water loss. Uh, they, as I hear, and I'm going to have to go there and see myself, before I can say this, in, uh, but as uh, talking to people uh, that have been there, they uh, retreat deeper into the forest and uh, they aren't as active and maybe they're being a little bit lower. I, I don't. And so they're conserving their water and they don't move. And uh, that's that's what happens with my Parsons here uh, during the winter. He doesn't move. He doesn't uh, he doesn't feel like moving. He's awake. He's looking at me, but he doesn't he's not interested in eating. And so that's uh, that's going to be shared by any any chameleon in Madagascar is going to go through that that time. So uh, that's that's also Jackson's chameleons have two wet seasons and two dry seasons. Uh, they're a little bit of a different animal, but um, so yeah, it it has a natural component, and maybe you are triggering the uh, the environmental conditions are triggering them to uh, settle in. And actually, that's a big thing that we're looking into. We, meaning me, Chameleon Academy, and I'm asking other uh, experts, uh, how do we uh, how do we Im implement a wet or dry season uh, without risking the chameleon's health? So that that's that's uh, the future of our chameleon husbandry there. Um, 
All right, let's go ahead and, oh boy. Well, let's see, Jonathan Hill has a question. How much does cage type, like full screen, impact hydration strategy choice? <laughs> all right, all right. I am amusing myself by the answer I want to give. Uh, your cage type should be get a, a, a choice based on what your environment is. And so it should be uh, being if your environment is uh, what your chameleon needs and you have high humidity in your environment, then you should get a screen cage. If you don't, then you have a, a solid side cage which can hold in the humidity. And uh, what is your the hydration strategy choice? Well, uh, the uh, that that will uh, depend upon how dry or how humid your area is. If you are in the southeast and you are on the Gulf Coast, then you typically have hum humid nights into the uh, 80s, 90s. Well, you're gonna a screen cage is a really good idea. Uh, if you're in California, where the humidity can get down to six percent. Uh, hybrid cage is a really good idea. Uh, and uh, But you know what? My hydration strategy choice is uh, you know, the drier it is, the more I give. That's because we decide how much we've got to give based on what the chameleon needs. And uh, so cage type, I would say, does not impact hydration strategy choice. I would say the environment impacts the cage type choice and the environment around whether it is the environment in your room or the environment that you create within the cage is uh, dictates your hydration strategy so yes and i and i know jonathan well and i know he uh he decided to give me a meaty question thank you jonathan so okay let's uh we have a lot of different um different questions here um but let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, I just want to review some of the um, some of the things about uh, drink uh, cup drinking, uh, and uh, you go and you see a group group of people who have coalesced, and they decide this is the way to do it. So we've got like a Reddit group that believes that not only is cup drinking a valid hydration method but it is the superior method that it should be done instead of misting. They allow a little bit of misting. Uh, and so how are you going to evaluate that? How are you going to decide between, uh, and they say, okay, everybody else has got so much misinformation that they're going to mess you up. And you go to the, <laughs> just about anywhere else, and they're going to say, uh, no, they're crazy. Uh, they don't know what they're talking about. And you listen to the podcast. I said, yeah, this whole thing about missing being dangerous is completely wrong. So how are you going to make that decision? And uh, before I get into all of these different controversies, I'll just say you don't have to make a decision. If it's confusing to you, uh, just be patient with yourself. Just be patient with the whole situation. And uh, you know, pick one wherever you're getting advice from and you're comfortable with. And just stick with that for a while until you get your feet under you. And then you can make an evaluation between all of these very loud voices. Everybody's saying they're right and the other person's wrong. So, uh, yeah, don't, don't, yeah, I hate saying that when I know that you've got certain groups that are just out to lunch, but why should you, why should you trust me over them? I mean, uh, I'm just uh, another digital voice in this world. If you don't know my background, you don't know everybody else's background. What's the difference? So um, it takes a while before you figure out who the lay of the land, just like any other situation. You come to a new school, you got to figure out the lay of the land. New job, got to figure out the lay of the land. And this is no different. So um, be patient with yourself. There's no hurry. There's no hurry. So, uh, let's see. Hey, Mickey has made it. Hello. 
Uh, let's see. Warren is at Dunkin' Donuts getting uh, his coffee. Excellent, excellent. Um, Jenny is still looking for this Reddit group form. Is this just the regular chameleon group? It's just, uh, well, I think it's backslash chameleons. I, I think that it's just that. Um, all right. Uh, Die Hard, Jenny says, yep, but you do great research and have 40 plus years. Yes, I do. And I will put my, my resume up against anybody's resume. But the thing is, when somebody comes to a group, a Facebook group, they don't they don't know that they they, they haven't looked into what every who everybody is, and so you, these people like you know Chris Anderson comes on Doctor Chris Anderson, who is a bona fide chameleon scientist. He comes onto Facebook and he looks like just like anybody else, just like I do, and just like somebody who's just had six months of experience or two years of experience and decides that they are now going to start a group. They're an admin. So I guess they're an expert. I mean, nobody can tell the difference between the two. Um, oh, wait a minute. Am I calling somebody wrong? <laughs> All right. Inspector gadget. Howard. That's Howard. You're Howard. Am I calling you Warren again? Richard. Wait a minute. All right, Inspector Gadget, correct me. What is your name? Who am I? Who am I talking to? Oh gosh, I'm so embarrassed. Uh, Die Hard Fishing. I'm very curious to hear your opinion on human humidifiers in the room at night. Maybe with a fan. Okay. Now we're getting into the uh, talking about hydration, which is a great, great thing to talk about. Uh, human humidifiers. That's humidity, and that works, and that is great. Here's the problem with human human humidifiers in Howard. Thank you. Uh, in the room, most rooms uh, of our rooms are not designed to hold 90 to hundred percent humidity at night. The paint will peel. Uh, wallpaper is gone. Everything's going to get soaked. It's we, our human houses are not designed to hold, uh, give high humidity. Our bathrooms have special paint and those are designed uh, for higher humidity, although I don't know that they're designed to have it like all night. Um, and many of us have found this out the hard way uh, by, like me, I had a one of those greenhouse humidifiers. I put it in my garage. Well, I learned the hard way that garages are not designed for high humidity. And so that is the one problem with humidifying your room instead of just the cage. So on the surface, using a human humidifier, human humidifier, perfect. That's fine. Uh, humidifying the room instead of just the cage, perfect. That's wonderful. And actually, that's better. I would rather set up a humidifier in the middle of the room and humidify the entire room and then use screen cages. I would rather do that than to have uh, a, a smaller hybrid cage that I've got to create the, uh, the, uh, proper environment within that cage, because the larger the space, the easier it is to give, uh, give the gradients and, uh, and the gentle humidity. I mean, if uh, my entire room is 90%, uh, it's, it's not as stuffy, but if I've got a small, small cage, like we do, you're trying to create all that environment in a smaller space and it's it's more challenging. So, but we, many people don't have the opportunity or the, uh, uh, yeah, the opportunity to be able to do that. So they've got to do it within a cage. Anyway, that's the, that's the answer. Human humidifiers are great. You just have to worry about the room. And uh, if you're uh, you know, you just, I mean, if you, uh, raise it up to the room humidity up to 50% and then the cage just has to go up to 90% at night, I mean, that, that's a way to uh, implement it as well. So, uh, let's see. All right. Eliza Ann, I first started with one of those leaf fountains for my veil to drink out of. I felt it wasn't very hygienic. I love the hydration strategy you teach. 
excellent. I'm glad you enjoy the hydration strategy, uh, the naturalistic, I call it naturalistic, uh, because that's been years in putting together and talking to people about them in the wild. And it, it pretty much replicates uh, what uh, the wild condition, but we're going to be, there's going to be more to it. I'm still researching. Uh, maybe it may have some more trips in my future for that. Uh, but yeah, any, any fountain just becomes a little bit difficult to maintain. Uh, they will use them, but uh, there's some maintenance to that. Uh, let's see. Oh, there's Jenny saying, I wiped away mold from the ceiling today because I have such a high humidity because of my cam. Yeah, yeah. I just noticed in my chameleon room, I've got a little bit of uh, mold I'm going to have to take care of. And that's that's just what we're dealing with. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We'll, we'll do a couple more questions here and then we'll get into, let's see if uh, we can get into some controversy and some fun here. Troy says, have you seen chameleons choosing to be in a bedtime spot in place at a.m. early time before lights go out? Uh, they're on timers. I have two and both, they choose to go to bed early. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, chameleons, they will adapt to this human thing where uh, there is no sunset. It's all of a sudden nighttime. And so I, I don't know how they do it, but it's very common for chameleons to go, okay, it's an hour before lights out. And so I'm going to get myself into position and I'm going to go to sleep. And so uh, if your chameleon, it, we always say if your chameleon is, has their eyes closed while the lights are on, there's a problem. The one exception is if it's an hour or uh, before uh, the lights go out and they're going to their position to sleep and they go to sleep and then they sleep through the night, that's your exception. That's perfectly healthy and that's a common usual chameleon behavior. So you're good. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is what happens with fountains. Uh, she pooped in the first one, so I threw it away. Yeah, there's something about fountains. Chameleons love to poop in them. The crickets go there for the the uh, the water, but chameleons love to poop in them. You know what? They love to poop in their food dishes too. And I don't know what it is about mine, but those chameleons, I got picture of the chameleon actually stretching and doing its best to stick its cloaca in position to poop into uh, my food dish. I don't know. Maybe they just don't like me. That's possible. It's possible. Um, mm -hmm. All right, guys. Hey, Bobby, Bobby's getting some dragon ledges. All right. So how about we take a look at that uh, evaluation that I did for evaluating the cup drinking? I did, uh, 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 you uh, asked three things. First, does it provide a benefit? Second, does it uh, solve a problem? And third, does it lead us closer to a natural condition? And uh, the the follow-up is if there's anything being used to support all of this, uh, we ask, um, uh, what would the world look like if that were true? What would the world look like if it weren't true? And so that's the way we evaluate. Hey, Natalie made it. <laughs> oh, Bobby says they already got the dragon ledges. Excellent. Um, so let's uh, do, is there any controversy Anything that's confusing you that you would like to evaluate here in live, go ahead and put it in the chat. If there's something that that you're confused about, um, you know, I'll, I'll go ahead and and by the way, I need to um, warn everybody. Uh, this this uh, I, I risk offending my my people, so I am sorry about this. Uh, whenever you start getting into controversy. Uh, a lot of people pick sides and they're very um, passionate about their sides. And so uh, I'm get, I, th this could get a bit fiery, but let's go ahead and take a look at some of the controversies. Um, one of the controversies we can uh, we can pick out first is uh, is uh, Rapashi Calcium Plus uh, used as a supplement every for every feeding. and uh, the reason why this is a controversy is because Rapashi Calcium Plus has a, uh, a respectable amount of vitamin D3. And we know that dietary D3 is, um, 
is not regulated by the chameleon's body, like UVB. If they get D3 through UVB, they will shut off D3 production when they have enough. And so D3 through UVB is uh, controlled by the body. So you never have an overdose of D3. That the, that kind of um, a, a check and balance is not there for the dietary D3. So if they take in too much dietary D3, they are going to get a, they, they will be going towards a D3 overdose. Now we don't know at what point it becomes an overdose, uh, but uh, so this is the, uh, the concern. This is why in my supplementation schedules, you see that I have a minimum, if any, vitamin D3 through the supplement. Uh, I do have D3 whenever I give vitamin A because they're they're connected in some way. We've got to figure that out. But um, so we have some prominent breeders, Camouflage Creations, Chromatic Chameleons, uh, I believe Highlighter, uh, that use Rapashi Calcium Plus for every feeding. And so they are giving dietary D3 every feeding, like every other day. Whereas like me, I'll give it every two weeks. And you know, Facebook is big on, okay, two weeks and any more than that, and you've got problems. And so now you have a number of people on social media saying, uh, if you do Rapashi Calcium Plus for every feeding, you're going to do a, a give a vitamin D3 overdose and your chameleon is going to be sick. And it, get, it gets pretty uh, political and pretty uh, pretty heated. So how about this? How about we evaluate that situation? One, yes, we know that uh, that dietary D3 is not able to be regulated. Uh, and uh, we know that you're getting a whole uh, you're getting vitamin D3 in every dosing, uh, every dusting with a repash calcium plus. So, uh, at what point does it become dangerous? Because we know they can accept a little bit. They need some vitamin D3. And so the question is, does Rapashi Calcium Plus have too much? And uh, and so you would guess by the passions and the people saying, if you give it every day, every uh, feeding, that you will harm your chameleon, that there would be evidence to support that. So is there? Uh, let's evaluate that situation. Do we believe that a Rapashi Calcium Plus, given every day or, or every feeding, will result in vitamin D3 overdose? And uh, so the question is, that that's a, a statement that's test, it's testable. It's not a new hus husbandry technique. And so we can ask, if that were true, if giving Rapashi Calcium Plus every feeding uh, gave a D3 overdose, what would we expect to see? And do we see that? And if it was not dangerous, if it was totally within your chameleon's ab ability to uh, um, take in that amount, uh, that amount of vitamin D3, what would we expect to see? What would we uh, expect the world to see? Um, and what's great is with all of the... Uh, all of the uh, these breeders, significant breeders, who have who use this regimen, we have a lot of data points out there, and so we can test it. Is Rapashi Calcium Plus too much? And I'm gonna tell you at this point, with the hundreds, thousands, I don't see vitamin D3 overdose, and so before somebody can come and say that dusting Rapashi Calcium Plus for every feeding is dangerous, they're going to have to show that they're going to have to explain why we're not seeing it. Is it because it's hidden inside the body and uh, the, the organs are getting calcified and we just don't see it and the chameleons are living five to seven years uh, with this and they would live longer? if they didn't have this calcification on the organs? Well, that would be easy to determine. We just take some of these chameleons and do necropsies on them. The thing is we need to do a number of them. I, I am sure some vet out there has done a necropsy and said, oh, okay, I see a calcification of the organs. 
but that doesn't explain why it's not more widespread or is how dangerous is that uh and so just because we are waiting until we have real evidence doesn't mean we're saying it's not happening what we're saying is you've got a great hypothesis prove it before you say it's true and i think that's fair i i not think it is fair that is that is, the burden of proof is upon anybody who's got the some hypothesis that they want to push forward this is a fact and we have the right to say uh okay explain why we have all these hundreds and hundreds of chameleons that are healthy that are having repatriated calcium plus dusted every feeding once you explain all that what we're seeing how that fits into your hypothesis we'll see if your hypothesis makes sense now i'm saying this as a guy who says take vitamin d3 out of your diet that's my biggest thing you see in my my supplementation i don't i i, I recommend against doing repatriated calcium plus every day because it goes against what i'm trying to do in being more and more natural and right now our understanding is that the insects have a minimum of vitamin d3 that may change that may change because we're doing more and more studies we're seeing how insects absorb vitamin d3 or, or create vitamin d3 from uvb so it may change but for our sitting right now i'm saying i don't re recommend doing repashy calcium plus every feeding that said i can still acknowledge that i don't see the evidence that it's dangerous uh that would just mean that the amount that, of vitamin d3 that they're getting in repatriate calcium plus does not uh go over the line for an overdose and, and that's that makes sense it's simple so that's that's one way that we can use this evaluation even on a technique that we personally don't support so let's see, uh, I'm going to go back and take a look at uh, the chat. I was off on my a rant, so wasn't reading. Uh, let's see. Uh, doo -doo -doo, go, blah, 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 blah. Um, <laughs> hey, uh, Patrick. Keep politics out of here. Please keep pol politics out of here. Um, if you do that again, we're going to have to do something different and get you going. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm trying to get, why is this not working? There we go. Okay. Sorry. 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 All right. Um, uh, Troy Butzner has a question about the fogger. Okay, we are going to get to that. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's add, uh, talk about what I just talked about when it comes to supplementation. Kyla Nobles says, how often should I use Reptivite or calcium powder? I would say calcium powder uh, every feeding. Reptivite is a multivitamin, and I'd say do that every two weeks or every month for Jackson's Chameleons. Um, but uh, you can, uh, Kyla, you can go to the Chameleon Academy on any of the care summaries that are on there and that's gonna talk about what's right for that species. Um, she's asking, is not a D3 overdose eventually taking all out the calcium out of the cam's bones? Uh, there's, there's gonna be a lot of things going on. Uh, should we? Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Go ahead. Girl. Okay, guys. Uh, we're, yes, we're going to have a little, um, a little interruption. Go ahead and bring, bring sure, Vixen. <laughs> well, oh gosh. Go. All right. All right. I want to introduce you to Vixen, who is going to help me with, uh, with my dog bone. <laughs> and so I want to introduce you to uh, my girl and you can uh, see why uh, dogs uh, essentially are the highest life form in this house okay Woo. anyway uh the initial uh, effect of having too much d3 is that uh you get more calcium into the body and so uh with uh, and this calcium ends up getting calcified around the organs and so it gets placed 
in different places that it's not supposed to, and that becomes a problem. Uh, but let's when you start getting imbalances within the body, a lot of strange things happen. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if one of those strange things would be uh, taking calcium out of the bones. I know phosphorus does stuff like that, but uh, the the most obvious thing that we can tell if some if a chameleon has a D3 overdose is the calcification, calcium being put in the wrong places and in and around like the heart and organs and stuff, and that's not good. So um, let's see. Let's do, 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 do. All right. I'm just going to make sure. Hello, Lee. Uh, we've got a lot of extra extra comments that don't have much to do with supplementation, and that's okay. Um, all right. Howard is saying, Bill, I think in the next two years you will change your mind as more evidence comes out. I am a big fan of evidence, and I am a big fan of changing my mind when that evidence comes out. Um, and so, hello, Ania from Finland. And nice hair. Okay, I like my hair. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, yes, I, you know, Howard, I, I am a, uh, the thing is, even if I suspect something is true, I can't, I can't support it until there's the evidence because it's so easy to get waylaid make assumptions and then build more things on top of assumptions that make it really hard to back out of once you see uh, the evidence. But in, in the case of vitamin D3 overdose, uh, I, all it all it takes is for us to get some, um, some uh, uh, breeders from camouflage, chromatic highlighter, that have been on that diet for all their lives and take a look at the necropsy. Uh, there was one, had one opportunity where there was a panther chameleon that, that was a longtime breeder, camouflage. They did a necropsy and did not find the calcification of the organs or extra calcium in there. So uh, uh, there's no documentation to support that, no pictures, no vet signature. So it was just in a personal conversation. Uh, and so anybody who wants to challenge that, I, I don't have the evidence to just uh, put that down and say, okay, here's your data point. Uh, but you know, that's the way to do it. Let's, let's prove it that it happens over uh, a wide range. We can always find some vet has done some necropsy and says, oh, okay, there's calcium deposits. And then what usually happens is the people who want to push a certain narrative uh, take that and say, see, here's our proof. And it may be, but we got to be so careful. We've got to uh, we've got to attach standards to what we are going to go with. And, and just as a community, not not only in this situation, but this is how I try to run the Chameleon Academy. I there is a standard of proof. We need that proof. Uh, and we can't just allow us to be swayed with weak proof if it just because it agrees with what we say, because that way, because that means that we are lowering the standard that the people who have the opposite argument, well, now they can, uh, they can just say, well, my cousin said this. And so, uh, we just have to be very careful, uh, that we don't lower our standards for what we accept as support for us and what other people uh, accept as support for what they say. We'll keep it all on the above board. And as the evidence comes out, we say, okay, earned it. Let's do it. So uh, Liza Ann says, uh, my daughter loves your dog. Your daughter has good taste in dogs. I'll say that. <laughs> oh, love Shiba Inu. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. Okay. So here's a, my mother is a vet tech, uh, but I can give her an ask and, and her opinion, given her knowledge. Yeah. See, Natalie, this is the, this is the thing. We know that vitamin D3 overdose can cause 
uh, the calcification of organs. We know it's bad. And so the question is, does Rapashi Calcium Plus, given on a every every uh, feeding basis, does that cross the line? And that's the uh, that's the question. And it becomes a question because we there were politics in the uh, the chameleon world. There was these Facebook groups that were just rabid against this. And and was it a personal vendetta? Maybe, maybe. But of course, when people have personal vendettas, they don't wrap it in such. They wrap it in some scientific thing and make it official sounding and so uh yeah i believe that there was personal vendetta involved here and so people decided they wanted to go after someone who had a big name and it was just you know it's just something that social media groups do and that's the reason why i'm the target of a lot of social media groups hey, he's got a big name then we can be big people by attacking you know yeah, we just got to make sense. That's the problem. So, uh, so anybody, so if we're going to be uh, proving that Rapashi Calcium Plus has too much vitamin D3, then we need to put together tests that number one, prove it, and number two, explain why we're not seeing problems on the vast majority of uh, the chameleons that are on this, this regimen. And, uh, you know, waiting for any any sort of evidence right here just waiting waiting um uh let's see let's go i'm just going to okay we had a question up above oh well here's one my breeder, Framscam, says very little vitamin D. My vet said my panther needs more vitamin D. It's tough to know. Okay. Uh, panther chameleons, chameleons, they get vitamin D from exposure to UVB. Um, and so what we're trying to do is, I mean, to go be natural, you want to get vitamin D from your UVB as little as possible from our supplementation with our current understanding. With our current understanding. Uh, and so uh, when you say very little vitamin D, that may be very little dietary vitamin D, but your vet said your panther needs more D. Why, why does your, I mean, I'll be interested in seeing why your vet said your panther needs more D. But if you, um, uh, to give yourself that vitamin, UVB light does it. And uh, it's com the, the chameleon completely regulates it. So they get as much as they need and uh, then they stop. So, uh, do, 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 do. Whew. all right, everybody, I am getting really far behind on the comments here. I am sorry, but somebody up here, I wanted to get to, what was his name? Troy. Yes. Is this it? Troy's confused about misters versus foggers. Some people say both. Some people say on the one or the other. Industry seem to be leaning toward both. Okay. Um, foggers. Wonderful topic. And Troy, you're right. You have some people saying um, <clears throat> foggers are dangerous because they're unhealthy and you'll get a respiratory infection if you get too much fog. And then you go on the other side. And you listen to Peter Neches and he says, no, chameleons can drink with fog and they can be totally hydrated with just fog. And uh, and then I, I and so you've got the, the wide range of uh, things out there. And so, yeah, being confused is easy on this. Um, the way I look at foggers is that uh, I look at it as a tool. I want there to be a certain level of humidity during the day and then at night i want it to jump up i have to use a method to increase humidity at night to match the levels that my chameleon that i want for my chameleon and so a fogger is a tool that i use to get that i could use a humidifier i could use a mister um, i don't use a mister because that's a lot of water uh, that has to go through the cage to keep that humidity level up throughout the whole night. So for if I'm trying to get the humidity level up, I'll use a fogger because it uses less water to get the job done. And and the chameleon is going to be breathing that in. 
Uh, to the people that say that uh, fogging will cause respiratory infections, I, anything will cause a respiratory infection if it's stressing the chameleon out. Uh, and so uh, I don't know what to say other than uh, I've been fogging blissfully without respiratory infections for years. And I'm sure there's a condition if your fogger is, uh, is dirty uh, or you're blasting your poor chameleon with fog to the point where you're filling up the cage and there's nothing else to be. I, I don't, there's, I, I don't doubt that there's a situation where somebody has created an unhealthy situation with a fogger. It's, I mean, no matter what we use, people do that. Uh, but you know, I, I've been fogging for many, many years with not, no problem that I can relate towards fogging. So, uh, <clears throat> once again, you can, uh, if you want to uh, take an accusation like fogging is dangerous, what would the world look like if that were true? What would it look like if it weren't true? Uh, if it were true, then anybody who would fog would have dead and dying chameleons. That's not true. So, there has to be so it's not a black and white situation. Uh, I also want to, uh, we also need to keep in mind that everything that is said has a kernel of truth. So when you say that people, people are saying that the foggers are going to kill your chameleons. Well, who's saying that? Who is saying that? And let's take a look. Okay. Uh, we know our wonderful group on Reddit is decided that uh, foggers are going to kill your chameleon. Um, why did they say that? They say, well, the ball python people say that. Well, okay, okay. Uh, there's another group that doesn't like uh, foggers. Those are, uh, there's a German group that doesn't like foggers. Uh, some of the uh, English groups don't say, no, you shouldn't use foggers with chameleons. So how do we have all these different opinions? Well, there is a possibility that somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. So that's always a possibility. But when you start looking into uh, Europe, you may be in areas that naturally have higher humidity. So if you naturally have higher humidity, there's no reason to use a fogger because you've already got the humidity. And so if somebody uses a fogger just because somebody says you have to use a fogger, they may be creating an unhealthy situation for the chameleon. And this is why we have to understand why we use the tools. And we don't just do something because someone says use a fogger. We say, why do we have to use a fogger? It's to get the nighttime humidity up. Well, if your nighttime humidity is already up, you don't need a fogger. And so that is why you'll hear in, in some groups that are around England, they say, don't use a fogger. A fogger will kill your chameleon. And uh, if you're in Arizona, you don't necessarily know that that doesn't apply to you because somebody somewhere had a problem because they used a fogger. It got too, everything got too dripping wide, uh, wet. The chameleon got sick and you said, okay, we're not going to use foggers. That's the kernel of truth. And sometimes it takes a while for you to find the kernel of truth in some of these sound bites that have just gone, gone wild on the internet and everybody's repeating them. Uh, so that's, that's part of the detective work. Like I do a lot of that. It's kind of fun to do that. Um, but just, just know, by time the soundbite got to you, it may have uh, left the original validity that started it in the first place. So I just, uh, so that's why there's so many different groups that have, say things that seem to be contradictory. When you dive deep and you understand why they said what they said, uh, often you find out it's all two sides of the same coin. And uh, it's, it's funny in a sad sort of way how many people on the internet are fighting over two truths and it's they don't contradict each other they're just true in different conditions it's like somebody in arizona with the single digit humidities arguing with somebody uh in the gulf coast or in england that has 90% humidity and they're arguing about hydration, what's right? Well, you can see how they're going to have different perspective. And by understanding each other's perspective, they're going to find 
that they both have valid uh, approaches. And, and, you know, screen cage or hybrid cage, well, it depends. They're both valid in different situations. And so you can't say chameleons need screen cages. Chameleons need hybrid cages. When do they need them all? Once we understand when they need the hybrid cages, when they need the screen cages, when they need a fogger, when they don't need a fogger, that's when we really start to have a handle on chameleon husbandry. So, okay, I'm going to get back into the chat here. And let's see. Sorry, everybody, if I've missed your comment, uh, I am, uh, I, I am uh, definitely falling behind. Uh, let's see. Um, doo -doo -doo. Uh, let's see. Okay, okay. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, boy, uh, go around. Is there any other? Uh, while I'm going through this, is there any other controversy out there? Um that you would like for us to uh, take a look at. Um, all right, here I'm going to, okay. Ray, Reedy's Rainforest, we don't fog at all, never have. I think chameleons are extremely adaptable. That's why so many ways work for all of us. There's more than one way to cook the egg and raise a chameleon. All right, and, and Reedy, I'm not gonna, this isn't necessarily going at, uh, at you, but, uh, although there are a number of different methods to achieve what we're looking for, we do have to draw a line. We can't say everything works. There's a reason why you have been successful with fogging, uh, with not fogging. And there is the possibility that you could be more successful if you fogged. Uh, there's a possibility that things would go worse for you if you fogged. The important thing is what is a situation and when we know your situation and why it does or doesn't work and then we figure out somebody else's situation and why or it does or doesn't work then we can find those common threads but if just because you number one believe that you have the ultimate uh, optimate optimal uh, husbandry for where you are let's just assume that and that you don't fog it doesn't mean that somebody in Arizona won't benefit from fogging the important thing is knowing why and for that there isn't there isn't different ways of giving uh, there's different ways of giving a chameleon what they need but the chameleons need something and and there is an ideal set of conditions yes the chameleons are tolerant they will accept different things at different uh different conditions they will survive different conditions but if we're putting together a care summary, a care guide, we want to figure out what's best for them and not have people target any of these things that are in the tolerance zone. And so uh, this is why I, I bristle when people say, oh, there's many ways of doing it. Um, I, I, I think it's more safer to say, no, let, let's find the correct way of doing it, the best way of doing it, and then realize that chameleons can tolerate different levels of correctness but it's not something we should shoot for uh and so and like i said that wasn't necessarily directed at you reedy that that was it was a catalyst of just a general truth here let's see all right just going on through all of my uh, my comments here. Got a lot of people commenting. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see. Live in Utah and I have to fog to help maintain my humidity. What the heck? I. It's one o'clock. Okay. Ah, oh. uh, yeah. So okay, there's your uh, there's your answer. Uh, Reedy doesn't use fogging because. They live in Texas where it's naturally humid. I am going to turn off my, my mister there. So this is, um, and, and that that's that's true. If it's naturally humid, I would say don't fog. There's no reason to do it. You've already achieved your mission. And so this is this is just a uh, an example of why if somebody's saying you should fog and someone else is saying you shouldn't fog, it's good to 
uh, dig into the backgrounds of why they're saying it. And, and as a beginner, I know you can't, you don't know what questions to ask. And so it's like on the surface, it seems that there's this contradiction. Um, and, and yeah, uh, someone like me that I do, I live this and I've done this for decades. I can take a look at that argument and I say, okay, I understand where they're both coming from. And, uh, you know, jokes on them, they're both right. <laughs> but to a, a beginner, it is so confusing and I'm, I'm sorry about that. That's just life. And I don't know. I don't think there's any solution to that. Um, Alicia's James, they're adaptable. Sure. But we got sent home with a hamster water bottle when we picked up our boy. Oh, I remember that is like a hamster water bottles back in the seventies. That is, that is what we were trying. You could, you could train a chameleon to drink out of a hamster water bottle. You could, um, I, 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 there's a reason why <laughs> hamster bottles are not part of anything you will see on the chameleon Academy, uh, because that, uh, is something that we graduated from as soon as we could. I am absolutely shocked that there's a pet store out there that, uh, has still maintained that uh that technique yikes <laughs> oh yeah let's see um do, do, do. it was not a pet store yeah it was another owner oh <laughs> i am so sorry yeah I, that, that that actually is uh, is fascinating to me that there was there would be an owner out there that got that advice somewhere somebody is saying yeah you can just uh, let them drink from a hamster uh, hamster bottle okay I I don't know I don't know interesting so um, and here's uh, here's another good perspective. Uh, from Howard, let me get that right. <laughs> my male panther does not drink when I missed. My female, on the other hand, my female is in a screen enclosure with a window wrap over it. She drinks a lot when I spray. Another example of how chameleons can be different. I don't know if uh, the the cage differences make that much of a difference. Maybe they do, but uh, each chameleon is an individual, and so this is a reason why. It's important to watch your chameleons and, uh, you know, people are say, well, I've got, uh, these chameleons, they're in the same room. They've got the same cage in the same situation, except one drinks more than the other. Yeah. They're individuals just like human beings. And, uh, we all, our bodies are different. And so we need different things at different times. And, uh, this is why it's really important that you yeah, uh, you understand your chameleon and you give your chameleon what they need. And that's why I say all of my care guides on the Chameleon Academy, that's just to get you started. That's your starting point. I make sure you start with everything that you need. But after that, you listen to your chameleon. If your chameleon needs longer with the heat lamp, give your chameleon more heat lamp. Needs more water, give your chameleon more water. You've got uh, all of those fine adjustments. Uh, you should adjust for your chameleon. Never stick with the care guides or just to get you started. Never uh, uh, deny your chameleon more or less of what they need just because a care guide has a number. Those are all only just get you started. Then you got to listen to the expert, which is your chameleon. They know better than any of us. Um, Uh, let's see. We do have a Facebook user says if the majority of chameleons were adaptable, we would see more species living in secondary growth. Species have adapted to their niche environments. Yes, some do, but not the majority. And this is true. Like our, uh, I just got back from Panth uh, Madagascar, panther chameleons, carpet chameleons, oustalettes, they're all over the place. Even, I was surprised, Parsons. But uh, you get rid of primary growth forest and uh, you've lost most of your species. Uh, so this is this is one reason why, and I think this is the reason why this uh, user made this statement. 
that we want that it's worth trying to find the best way of taking care of a chameleon because even if the chameleon can accept a number of different ways that's that one chameleon that's maybe that species like veiled chameleons judging judging your husbandry based on whether a veiled chameleon survives or not is no test at all i mean that's the most basic level test uh, we do not judge husbandry success by whether a veiled chameleon or even a panther chameleon survives it uh, we judge success if uh, some of the more rare sensitive species uh, survive it so uh, yes this is a uh, comment is absolutely correct um, so all right everybody i i thank you i am going to have to um oh is this carl carl was that are you the one that said about the niche that sounds like something carl coteau would say and uh carl thank you very much if that is you really appreciate it uh it's always good to hear from you uh in your perspective so um all right uh everybody I am going to have to, um, oh, okay, that is Carl. Yes, thank you. It's wonderful to have you at the, uh, getting your perspective uh, with these uh, these sessions. Uh, all right, everybody, I am going to have to uh, sign off here. We're at our hour mark, and I've actually got an interview to do in uh, at two o'clock, getting ready for the chameleon hour, uh, which is going to be a, a fun one, I think, for uh, next week's Friday. But I will be here on Saturday for uh, because I do the uh, the Saturday lives every week. Uh, and uh, if anybody wants to talk to me next, uh, I will be doing a Tuesday night with Instagram. I do Tuesday nights at uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. And then I'll be back here next Saturday and we will talk chameleons. So thank you very much for joining me. I'll see you all later. <laughs>